So, Mikkel, can you tell us more about this finding? Sure. As Thomas mentioned, uh, we used a Spitzer Space Telescope with an uh, overgrown base telescope to uh, discover around the same star not one, not two, but seven Earth-sized planets. And this is the first time that uh, so many Earth-sized planets are found around the same star. Furthermore, with three of them in the habitable zone. And the star itself is what is called a ultra cool dwarf, which is the least massive kind of stars that exist. And these stars are much smaller, much cooler than our sun. And still, they are very frequent in at the scale of our galaxy, more frequent than solar-type stars. And if you look at this illustration, you see the comparison between a basketball and a golf ball. Well, in our case, the basketball would be the sun, and the golf ball, it would be Trappist-1. So Trappist-1 is much cooler, much smaller than our sun, and so the planets it's in its habitable zone are much closer to it, very close to it, with very short orbital periods. And in the, this graphics, what you can see are the planets uh, which are around, which were found around Trappist-1, with the three of them which are in the habitable zone, so also called the Goldilocks zones, where liquid water could exist, is the most likely to exist at the surface of a rocky planet. Having three of these Earth-sized planets in this habitable zone is very promising for the search for life beyond our solar system. So what can you tell us about these distant planets? Well, we have measured with Spitzer very, very precisely their sizes. And furthermore, we have, thanks to Spitzer too, uh, preliminary uh, measurements of their masses for six of them. And for one of them, our measurement is precise enough to strongly suggest a water-rich composition, which is very exciting because this is one of the planets in the habitable zone. Furthermore, these planets are orbiting so close to the star that they must be, or they are probably, tidally locked, which means they always face the star with the same sight, like the moon, to the Earth. And so if you look at this uh, animation, you can see uh, a view of tidally locked planet with a permanent day side and a permanent night side. The Trappist-1 planet could be just like this. Now what is also exciting here about this system is that the planets are so close to each other. If you were on the surface of one of these planets, you would have a wonderful view on the other planets. You wouldn't see them uh, like uh, we see Venus or Mars, like dots of light. But as you can see in the next illustration, you would see them really as we see the moon. You would see worlds with, uh, which are very big. You could see the structures on these worlds. They would be as large as the moon and even larger for some of them. So it would be a, a wonderful view on these planets. Thanks, Mikkel. So, Sean, can you give us an idea or more context to discovery and why Spitzer played such a vital role? Absolutely, Felicia. i first like to say that I my opinion, this is the most exciting discovery we've had yet with Spitzer in its 14 year, almost 14 years of operation. As you can see in the graphic, uh, the initial discovery of the TRAPPIST-1 system was by the TRAPPIST telescope in Chile in 2016. And it, immediately after that, we started doing intensive follow-up with a lot of ground-based telescopes and more than 20 days of observa continuous observations with Spitzer. And what we're able to find is that we confirmed two of the planets that were found in the initial discovery and then found five more planets for total of seven planets in the system, which is, which is pretty exciting. Now, TRAPPIST-1 is an ultra-cool dwarf, and that means that it's much brighter in the infrared, thousands of times brighter in the infrared than in the visible. So it makes it ideal to use Spitzer, which is an infrared telescope, to do the follow-up on this system. And then, as you can see in this animation of Spitzer, so Spitzer was, was launched in 2003, and it was never intended to study exoplanets. So we had to do some clever re-engineering why it's in space still, and it's more than an astronomical unit away from, from the Earth, so you can't fly out and do anything about it. But we did clever engineering on the ground to come up, to allow Spitzer to measure star brightnesses very precisely, a thousand times more precisely than we had imagined Spitzer would be able to do. And then what we're going to show in the next animation is how... What Spitzer sees the planets very similar to the way the Kepler Space Telescope does. We don't image the individual planets. What we do is the planets pass in front of the star. We see the amount of light that the star is dimmed by when that planet is blocking it. So the dips you see in this animation are the planets going in front of the star, blocking a little bit of the light. The size of the dip tells you the size of the planet. So we can get the size of the planet directly from measuring the dip. 
Now, when you see the different planets, they keep orbiting around and around, and every time they transit, you can measure the spacing between the transits, and that tells you about the orbit, the period of the orbit, how long that year is and once we for that planet. And then when we know how long it takes for the planet to go around the star, we also know the distance it is from the star, and that also tells us whether or not it's in the habitable zone. Now, the TRAPPIST-1 system and its planets are in an interesting configuration. The planets are all very close together, and their orbits are spaced such that they gravitationally interact with each other. They tug and pull each other as they go flying around, they orbiting around their star. And what that does is it changes the timing of the transits a little bit as the planets are tugging each other, so they don't happen as regularly as you would expect without the tug. And with that, the, measuring those differences, what we're able to do is measure the masses of the planet. So now we have the mass of the planet, the size of the planet, so we can make an estimate of what the density of the planet is. And that's important because that gives us some understanding about what the composition of the planet is. From that, we can tell where the planets are, whether they're rocky, gaseous, or even watery. Thanks, John. So, Nicole, what can you tell us about studying the atmospheres of these planets? Yeah, so the atmospheres of planets tell us a great deal about the formation and evolution of planets, and also about all of the physical processes that are occurring on the planet's surface and in the air, especially those that might make the planet habitable or actually indicative of, of hosting life. Um, we can use space-based telescopes today uh, to, to study the atmospheres of planets using a technique called transmission spectroscopy, which detects the fingerprints of different chemical species in a planet's air, such as water or methane, ozone or oxygen. We're currently using the Hubble Space Telescope uh, to study the planets in the TRAPPIST-1 system to determine if they have hydrogen-helium dominated atmospheres. It's actually great to find out if they don't. Um, that gives us a, another push forward in having these planets be, in fact, rocky, and also the potential of those planets to support water on their surfaces. Just last year, Hubble actually probed the innermost planets of the TRAPPIST-1 system, TRAPPIST B and C, and found that they didn't have uh, hydrogen-helium dominated atmospheres. So that's just one more step along the path to having these potentially habitable worlds. So what do we know about the three worlds in the habitable zone? Sure. So I'll use eyes on exoplanets here to give you a brief tour of the habitable zone of the TRAPPIST-1 system. So if we zoom out to the system away from the host star, you'll see all seven planets with the habitable zone indicated here in this blue region. The innermost planet in the habitable zone is TRAPPIST-1e. So in this illustration, uh, you'll, you'll see an artist's rendition of TRAPPIST-1e, which is a really interesting planet for a number of reasons. It's very close in size to Earth, as you can see here. It also is see, is, receives about the same amount of, of uh, light as Earth does in our own solar system. This means that in TRAPPIST-1e, you could have temperatures that are very, very similar to the ones that we have here on Earth. The next planet out is TRAPPIST-1f, now, this is a potentially water-rich world that is, again, about the same size as Earth. You see here in comparison. Now, TRAPPIST-1f uh, TRAPPIST has about a nine-day orbit, and during that time it receives about the same amount of sunlight as Mars does in our own solar system. And the final planet in the habitable zone of the TRAPPIST-1 system is TRAPPIST-1g. Now, TRAPPIST-1g is the largest planet in the TRAPPIST-1 system. It's about 13% uh, larger radius than that of Earth, as you can see in this comparison here. And it receives about the same amount of starlight as somewhere in between Mars and the asteroid belt in our own solar system. So while we don't have the technology yet to really travel to any of these planets, how long would it take to travel here? <laughs> Well, thankfully, we can ask eyes on exoplanets, and if we were able to travel at light speed, we, of course, could arrive in 39 years. Um, something more like a jet plane would take far longer, of course, something more on the line of 44 million years. Wow. Well, then, um, thank you so much, Nicole. Wonderful. All right, the next question here comes from Scott, who asks, any confirmation of water on the planetary bodies? I yeah, I can handle that one. There uh, has not been any confirmation of water on these planetary bodies, um, and it'll take uh, a, lot of, a lot of observations uh, with Hubble or in the future with Webb um, to, to probe the atmospheres and see if we can detect water on these planets. But I think it's fair to add that people are looking. Yes, we are certainly looking. <laughs> Great. This question comes from Twitter user Matthew, who asks, will this be one of the first observations for JWST? And how much can we learn about TRAPPIST, E, F, and G until that mission launches? 
I can I can take that one too. Um, you know, a lot of folks um, since learning about the system have thought about uh, observing it with JWST, and I am fairly certain that Cycle One will see some observations of almost all of the planets in the system. And then I guess to add further, even now we're continuing to take observations from the ground in Spitzer to look at the transit timing variation. So we're going to get better measurements of the masses of these planets as time goes by. And the next year we'll have much better measurements than we have currently. Okay, we're going to take one question on the phone line from Jay Bennett from Popular Mechanics, and then we're going to go back to social media. So Jay? Hello, everyone. Uh, I was wondering if the fact that Trappist-1 is a particularly cool red dwarf means that it's more likely to support planets that are potentially habitable because it doesn't have as much stellar activity, solar flares, uh, eruptions, these types of things. Uh, I can take this one. So uh, ultra cool dwarfs uh, are known to be very active when they are young, and this is the main concern about uh, these potentially habitable planets. That they, they, they could have been, uh, the atmosphere had been eroded strongly by the star when it was young. Now it's quite, it's a, a quite ultra cool dwarf, so it's not very active. But maybe uh, when it was young, the conditions were quite different. So it will be by observation that we will, we, we will really figure out uh, the past of this uh, planet and what happened during this uh, very active and uh, young phase. I'll just add to that and rephrase what Mikhail said to just say, the great news is we can observe in the near future. We no longer have to rely on what we think and speculation because nature usually is smarter than we are. And if there's any way for a life to get a foothold, uh, we like to believe it will. Thank you. Um, we're going to go back to social media. So, Jason? All right. This question comes from Twitter user Amara who asks, have you decided any names for these planets yet? <laughs> <laughs> a name to, to give them a name. Will they mean like a popular name? Like oh well, we have plenty of possibilities which are all related to Belgian beers, but we don't think they will become official. So right. <laughs> for now, let's call them B, C, D, and and so on. Admittedly, we have no way to easily give official names to exoplanets in the same way that we do for asteroids. But perhaps it's something we should try to change. Great. This next question comes from Twitter user Jofine, who asks, does the Earth-sized planets have any moons revolving around them? Uh, and if no, how can there be possible waves on water? Well, in our data, we have no indication of a moon. Uh, and so, furthermore, if we look at uh, our theory, uh, it would be uh, quite unlikely to have a moon around a planet so close to its star. So maybe if there are other planets still to found, Maybe they will. They could have a moon. We'll see in the future. There are still many news to come about the system. Oh, but I'll add further. The tidal forces between the planets are not negligible. So there, if there was water on these uh, planets, there would be tides as well because of the tidal forces between mm -hmm. the planets instead of planet moon. Yes, indeed. Next, we're going to go to the phone lines. We have Keith Cowing from NASA Watch. Keith? Hi, a question probably best for Sarah Seeger. Um, I'm looking at these planets. I assume they're really close together. Uh, it reminds me of the Jovian and the Saturnian systems where stuff is thrown from one world onto another, and there's questions about why, you know, is, should you consider these as an ecosystem? I'm a biologist. I'm looking at three potentially habitable worlds real close to each other. Should we be thinking that Conceivably, the biosphere around this very tight-knit group of planets might extend beyond just one planet if they're this close to each other. Well, that's a wonderful question, and we haven't thought that far yet, but I'm sure there's a student out there you know, listening in who should take this problem on. Um, I'll just back up one step, though, and answer a slightly different question, because if we want to think about an intelligent civilization elsewhere looking back at us, they may be having a press conference saying, hey, there's three habitable planets there. Venus, Earth, and Mars may appear to be in the habitable zone no matter how we describe it. So let's wait and see what's out there. But great question, and hopefully somebody will work on this. Jens from social media, I'd like to ask each of you to kind of give some thoughts about why this finding is so exciting for you personally. And we're going to start with Nicole and then work our way to Thomas. Yeah, so this, this finding is really exciting for me because this is a great opportunity to study Earth-sized planets, atmospheres in great detail. We know that we have good, you can get good signal to noise ratios, and we can start to begin this journey in trying to understand what the air is like around 
uh, rocky planets outside of our solar system. Well, I'll give two favorite reasons. One is when I and others started in exoplanets 20 years ago, our peers all dismissed the work as just stamp collecting. We'd never look at their atmospheres. We'd never be able to do this. We'd never be able to do that. So the fact that we're here today with seven planets and we know we can study their atmospheres in the future is truly tremendous. The other point I want to make is that we see, we're really excited because we all see ourselves here as just we're the group of people, we meaning us and all of our colleagues, as the pioneers. This is a search that will go on for many generations. And just the fact that we're this close now uh, to finding so many habitable worlds is really exciting. Yeah, so, so for me, it's more of a very kind of a personal experience because I've been, worked on Spitzer since 2002. And the ability to be able to do these observations, we had to do a fair amount of engineering work. And at the beginning, it wasn't clear necessarily that we would be able to achieve the precisions we need to do up science like this. So it's very gratifying that all our hard work, myself, my colleagues at the Spitzer Science Center, JPL and Lockheed Martin, the engineers there, uh, you know, we're able to pull it off and we're able to be able to give great data to scientists and get great results out. So it's, it's uh, yeah, I'm very happy about this. So on my side, I've already been, uh, um, uh, I've already wondered about the possible existence of life elsewhere since I'm a kid. And uh, so when I uh, went to uh, college to study uh, science, I first studied biology, biochemistry, because I wanted to understand what is life, really. Then I switched to astronomy because it was the beginning of the exoplanet adventure. We were really beginning to detect planets outside the solar system. And it was clear that within a few decades, we would be not uh, detecting giant planets which were unsuitable for life, but planets that, uh, that could host life, that we could study. So I've already been devoting my time in science to this goal. And uh, then we are, we are getting nearly there with this result. It's, it's a very good uh, satisfaction for me. To me, looking from the point of view of uh, NASA science program, it's exciting because it's, of course, it's a leap forward, but it goes in parallel to the other leaps we're taking right now. Look at what's happening at Mars, where we're really looking at the complex chemistry that's happening there. Look at the recognition that Mars actually is a place where there not only used to be water, but there's water today, abundant water. Uh, in parallel to that, uh, you know, the the recognition that we can now have the technology ability of going to Europa and actually looking at that system, which is in its own right really an exciting system because there's an ocean world there that hits the rock at the bottom in a really unexpected place in a, in a site. There's many other places like that. And then the, on the theory side, we already heard that kind of uh, the really understanding of the biology of life. Kind of, there's a tremendous amount of progress. So together these areas really create kind of a crescendo towards that, uh, really answering that question that has been on our minds for so long. This is the, the right time to ask that question. It is the right time to have this discovery right now.